I am I am a dumb person. Do I get a gold star or something for that? Let me know. <laughs> because reading is sexy and if you're not reading you're not sexy hello hello it's what day is it wednesday i'm i'm okay i'm okay i'm not okay actually y'all I'm, I'm reeling i'm reeling again and i'll save you the theatrics though because really i just need to deal with it <laughs> i just gotta deal with my feelings that's all just like really sit with them. But I have this like weird mix of books to talk to you about. They have no relation to each other and I'm not going to try and relate them to each other because that's too much work on my end right now. But they're fascinating reads, I'll say that. I first read The Right to Sex by Amiya Srinivasan. Stellar, I think what everyone said about this book. Who was it? Jiren, Pato, all my faves talked about this book and I thoroughly, enjoyed it in that it was really uh, eye-opening and enriching. There were just parts to this where it really called me out on a few things in terms of how I went about sex. Not, not going to dip into all of that, but for personal reasons, this was just really eye-opening in how I maneuvered my own body through a sea of other bodies and how we understand each other's bodies. Like, for example, 
when it comes to preferences, my type, when you involve ethnicities within that, it begins to become a really touchy subject and it made me realize how ultimately the body is political. When it is born into the world, it is automatically political. Even though the baby, the baby does not does not perceive anything, sex, race, gender, class, does not see any of that. It is ultimately born political. What do you do with that? How do you maneuver the rest of your life like that while it's still also trying to learn all of these things? Like, when you are born into the world, you are born into knowing and in this constant act of knowing. It's also within these educational moments, etages, that you really understand how the body cannot escape politics. And it's just something you have to live with. It's this uncomfortable puberty that just constantly happens throughout the years of your life. And that's, that's what Amiya has made me realize reading through this. And it's actually not a big read at all. I thought it was going to be big and dense. There's a bunch of notes in here, like half the book is just notes, which are just references and callbacks to other things. So it's, it's actually quite a short read, but a very powerful read. And I feel like a very necessary read for anyone living in the 21st century. All men, all men should be reading this and become a better advocate for the way we maneuver other bodies and sex in general, I think. It's an important read for those who do not exist within this field. Like if you are hardcore academic in terms of like um, gender studies, feminism, and all of those things like sex as well, this I don't think will lend a lot to you. But for lay people like me who are just curious and interested in subjects like this, I found it to be a very empowering read. Definitely pick it up. I think it's mandatory reading for all people right next to like All About Love by Bell Hooks. Like, ooh, like delicious, a heavy pairing, but quite a necessary pairing, I feel. All About Love, Bell Hooks, and this. It's up there with one of my favorite non of the year because I think it's really, really important. And can't believe this was out in like 2021 because I still think it says a lot to how we maneuver bodies when it comes to sex in 2023. Oh, but when this comes out, I think it'll be 2024, so I still think it'll be important in 2024. So, yes, pick it up. Mandatory. After that, I was like, okay, it's time to do it, because we're at the end of November right now, and I, I finished East of Eden by John Steinbeck. Once again, holding this copy up because it's delicious. Look at that. Isn't that insane? Look at James Dean. Oh, what a man, what a man, what a man. Oh. East of Eden, John Steinbeck. I mean, I'm really not gonna offer anything new to the table here, cause I don't get paid enough for that. But also, just like, everyone's said everything about this. We can go into the religious aspects, looking at Cain and Abel, the archetypes, all of the characters. Oh, Lee, Lee! Mm, what, what a beautiful caricature. <sighs> oh, the complexities of all of these characters, all in their literary thick, archetype just done so well. Kathy, what does it mean to be a monster? But also, what does it mean to just be a person tied between good and evil, rich and poor? And I think Steinbeck just creates, I get it, I get why this is called a great American classic, because it's very much what it means to be American. I, I think he revived the American dream. <laughs> for me. It's still alive. It still exists within this book. What does it mean to be American? It boils down to family. I think where you come from and how you become are ultimately the questions that are explored here. Um, though it is plot heavy, I think it is more character heavy. And I'm glad nobody told me this. I am so glad I didn't know much about anything when I came into this. But I will say, my only two Steinbecks that I've read before this, The Pearl, don't ask me what that's about. <laughs> I think on the cover, it was about like a giant, I don't like, again, don't don't ask me what that's about. But I, I think it's like a sea adventure story, a sea caper, where they try to get this really magical pearl of some sort. I just remember the cover 
there being like a giant stingray or manta ray or something and that's that's about it. <laughs> and then I read Of Mice and Men, which I thought it was fine, like for the classroom. I think it was just a, a fine book about, again, about the American dream, being on the poorer side of life and yeah, wanting that desire, wanting to see what's greener on the other side of the fence. So it's all about dream and desire, loss of innocence as well. But yeah, all of that is also explored in East of Eden. What I think I found incredibly enthralling was just the way that Steinbeck was able to paint California so beautiful and so grand. Like you could see and feel the golden light and the heat off of it. And I, I just love the, the very opening pages and just this very line in particular. Okay, where is it? I always found myself a dread of West and a love of East. So, so beautifully done. Okay, what I will say, after years of not having read Steinbeck, like I've only read Steinbeck within the context of the classroom. And though I wish I'd read this in the classroom now, I don't think my younger self would have appreciated this um, if I'd read it when I was like, say 16, 17. Now I appreciate it. And now I think I appreciate Steinbeck's prose because Steinbeck, I think, writes literary fiction, but he doesn't necessarily do it for the high academics even though this is favorable in the high academic sense. But I think Steinbeck writes for the people. There's almost this like poor man quality to his writing, this like down in the deep in the dirt. And it's very humble. There's something so humble about his prose. It's very laid out, flat with the earth, down to earth. He's a down to earth guy told through, I think his perspective of people and how his little people sort of interact with each other. And there's a naturalness to all of them. And I think I, I did a bit of digging and I found that his character, some of these characters are based off of people he knew, especially um, the grandfather character in here was based off of his own grandfather. And now it makes me curious, like, where did he find Lee? Like, who was, who was that real person in his life? But they're done with so much respect, so much character, so much color, and I, I love all the ways that the characters interacted with each other in this. It, it's just so, so grand, so wonderful. It's great. Uh, yeah, I see now why this is a great American classic. And now for Steinbeck heads, if you've read any more Steinbeck, would like to know what is your favorite Steinbeck? What Steinbeck should I go to next? I'm thinking Grapes of Wrath. Should we do it? Should we do it? I've always, always, always wanted to read the Winter of Our Discontent. Oh, I just love the title of that. And that title has always just like sat with me whenever I think of the cold for proper reasons. But yeah, but I heard that it's quite a boring one. So I'm not quite sure if I'll ever do it. If I find like a pretty cover of it, I'll, I'll do it. Steinbeck heads out there, let me know what your favorite Steinbeck is and which one I should read next. Loved this. Oh, we'll say I watched the film version out of 1955 by Kazan with James Dean. Very different, very different. So if you are, if you have this assigned in your classroom and you need the Spark Notes version of it by going to the film, do not do the film unless you're doing a stronger analysis or a peek at the brother relationship in here in regards to the American modernization of Cain and Abel. Other than that, uh, I think it was a, it's a very, frenetic film. Yeah, James Dean, he plays Cal, and in the film, I think he just plays his Rebel Without a Cause character. And it's so funny because that movie came out the same year this film came out. Still a very interesting film. It's just done in that like sort of 50s, 60s, hyper technicolor kind of way. It's very theatrical, very heavy on the dramatics, the melodramatics. Overall enjoyable because James Dean, like handsome cat. Like, I, I love that man to death. Still love him. Mm. I can't wait to go back home to LA whenever I do and just flip through my giant James Dean coffee table book. It's like my favorite thing ever. I got it as a steal for like three bucks at some like book sale thing. And I just, oh God, it's such a great book to flip through. I just love James Dean. Oh, most handsome man ever. Now I just can't unsee Cal as James Dean in the book as well. I, I see it now. And just that like troubling teenage 
self and wanting to do some more and sort of like remove himself from his legacy and just become his own person. It's, it, I think my teen self would have eaten that up, but to see very much why James Dean was casted as Cal. Um, okay, I just finished White Holes by Carlo Rovelli. This was sent to me by Random House, Penguin Random House. This is an ARC? I think it's already out though. It was out October 31st, Halloween of 2023. It's about white holes. I did not know white holes existed. They don't, I don't know. <laughs> We'll say half this book was about black holes and sort of like the last quarter of the book was about white holes and its exploration of it. But yeah, I learned a lot about black holes, which is interesting. I never knew that they were sort of like a, a funnel and that they're ever expanding and sediment within them. And it's, I was afraid this was going to be too sciencey for me, but Arlo is such a great writer in that he writes for the non-physics person. He writes for the lay person. And he has this very literary flair to his writing. So it's just beautiful the way that he goes about uh, talking about science and black holes. What's great is that some of the diagrams are quite big too. They take up whole pages sometimes. So it makes you feel like you're going by real fast. Um, but yeah, he just talks about it with this admiration and fascination and that it instills fascination in you so that you're driven to keep reading about it. I I never did well in science. I failed chemistry, I think. I like passed with a D in high school, if that says anything about me. But yeah, I hate science. But I think it's fascinating, myth busters kind of way. But like, yeah, I, I don't, me and science don't get along well. I applaud anyone who understands science. Like that is incredible. Like I wish I was at your level in terms of smarts, but I am I am a dumb person. And as a dumb person, this was really, really good. But yeah, if you are interested in black holes, you will be surprised to know that white holes exist. And you will find this, I think, very enriching. If you need a scientific read, this will do it for you. Yeah. If Carlo ever writes anything else outside of science, I will be happy to read it because I think he has really fun prose, just uses images and similes to compare science to other beautiful things in life and in terms of the arts. That just made a lot of sense and I wish I had in like my classrooms in science. A nice quickie. I think after I read something big like this, Oh, I also wanted to say, coming into this, my fear of this was that it would be really, really dense in that it was boring because it was an American classic. Like, I think Moby Dick is, I just did not enjoy reading that at all. Like, that feels like a textbook read to me. That gives major textbook vibes. Ulysses, James Joyce, that also gives, like, reading James Joyce in general also gives me, like, textbook vibes. Like, And I was afraid this was going to be it, but I actually, like, blew right through this. It was actually quite a fast read for me in that it kind of reminds me, which is dumb to say, but like I read it quick in a way that I would read a Franzen really quickly. There was just these swells of character interactions that just like make you plow through it and it's just a joy. There's this literary magic to it that makes you crunch through the pages a lot faster that I admire in Franzen's work at times and yeah, it made me crunch through this really quickly as well. Yeah, so I needed a tiny read and this is one of the tiny reads I decided to pick up. What am I reading now? Also trying to squeeze in another tiny, what is the date today? Just to let y'all know. It is the 22nd of November today, a few days before Thanksgiving. I'm not doing anything for Thanksgiving because Thanksgiving is not celebrated in Korea, if you needed to know that. Um, yes, it is American holiday. And though I am American, I am not celebrating it, which I think makes me somewhat of a cool expat in a way, because I reject this American tradition, colonialization. Do I get a gold star or something for that? Let me know. I started Gentleman Callers by Colleen Hoex. She's a Belgian writer. This is translated by Caitlin O'Neill, gifted to me by X Libris Alex. I'll leave their handle down below. They do fun book, old film content follow give them a follow they're they're wonderful but this is about a woman who dreams of many men 
many, many men, many kinds of different men within sort of the service industry. Thus far, we just got done with a butcher, a baker, gas station attendant, a swimming instructor, a mailman. Dreams of them in these really sexual way it just exists in dreams it's it's fun it's comical excited to see where it goes they sort of work like short stories they're just like very sparse um and vignette -y. and that's uh yeah i just started um just like a couple 40 30 pages in i love this pink cover and sort of the little drawings on it we are all objects of desire but are we subjects of desire I'll be thinking about that as I go through this. Yeah, I think I'm hitting like, not to say like reading fatigue, but just like real life is busy. I just haven't been in the best spirits. I'm still grieving. Uh, um, high anticipation of like December. December is just like, I, I don't like thinking about December because it's just such an expensive month. And anyway, that's where I'm at. Yeah, it's just the season of festivities really brings out the anxiety in me. And uh, yeah, even though I'm not celebrating Thanksgiving, exhausted by it. There's just like family stuff. Anyway, you don't need, you're not my therapist. You don't need to know any of this. Okay. Well, it, I hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving though. If you, if you do celebrate it and uh, yeah, because you're watching this in 2024 and because yeah, anyway. Anyway, what am I doing? What the fuck am I doing? <laughs> okay, I'll end it here. Otherwise, I'll just keep going on. Um, love y'all. Be well, do good work, keep in touch.